Hi there, everyone. How are you? I am going to get out of this screen real fast, and I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Um, let me make sure that my microphone, you know, I'm always paranoid about that. I am going to do something totally different than what I normally do. Those of you who know me know that this is a first. Um, okay, so let's say here. I was told that Deception Detective is somebody that I would really, really get along well with his line of thinking. And I am so happy to say that I could not agree more. Deception Detective, I think that you're brilliant and I really love your input. And I think that it really speaks to how there are so many of us speaking on different angles that this is what is representative of what would have and should have happened in the event that there was a trial for Christopher Watts. It is my belief that there should still be a trial for Christopher Watts. It is my belief that it has not been shown to me beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christopher Watts did the unthinkable, did it alone and or did it with a sound mind, body and soul. I have put probably close to a thousand hours, if not more, into personal research on this case. And as such, I showed every single document that I could, that I could responsibly source and say, I found this document here. I watched this video here. From those, I took my own personal background and educational background and explained through, as you say, we both see each other's viewpoints here is through the process of, of deduction. So saying, okay, this is said here, so this would equal that. This is the logical conclusion of this behavior. In so doing, it is the behavior that I am looking at and it is the behavior that I am calling out. I am standing alone on my channel. I'm a very small channel because I allow people to comment once and if they bring misinformation or are threatening me or anybody else I remove them even if they're a subscriber so my block list is higher than my subscriber list because I will not allow the fighting in my channel and I won't allow misinformation to be brought there is so much misinformation out there that that has grown problematic in its own right and what I believe is a lot of people who were in covering the Watts case as they do others are tragedy vultures and they get into these cases and they get in them to make money for themselves and gain subscribers and and get their own platform they don't have the right reasoning and the money shows it i have no problem being very transparent about the money that i have made as i have made a fraction of what minimum wage even would be in that i have i think i did over 400 watts videos at least one hour each some three hours some have been taken down some have been removed um some condensed otherwise. And I have made, I am now not monetized as I was falsely struck and YouTube is standing behind that, that false strike. And I, it took me four months to make $100 out of AdSense the last time. So I am far, far under making $1,000 for over two years of work far under um, and that's all aspects so I have no problem um, showing that proving that I am not in this for the money I am in this because I do not believe that the truth is out there yet I believe that to honor the children that were actively being mistreated in that home the truth needs to come out so that we can identify the behavior and show that abusers don't look like monsters that you can be a beautiful woman and be abusive that until we are honest about the stress that was going on in that home we will never understand and if we do not understand that we cannot prevent and educate so that what happened in that watts home never happens again the people who were in 
one of the money trains had it said that there was a three-year limitation on Christopher Watts's deal that he made, the worst deal on the planet, if you ask me. They were saying that there was this three-year thing and they were trying to get momentum and money. There was a lot of money. There's a lot of fights. And those people are in personal litigation right now. Like one of them has 20 cases against other people. So some of the drama going on in the Watts case is tying up our courts right now. I researched it and I believe that under a 35C Christopher Watts can still get a trial. I do not believe that there was the three-year limit. The three-year limit is for lesser than capital murder. The way that I have researched it, it states that for capital murder, there is no time limit for a 35C in the state of Colorado as long as there is more information known than at the time of the sentencing or trial, in, if there was a trial. Many people believe that there was a trial. They don't know that there was not. Christopher Watts rejected any type of legal representation and his mail was not given to him until an after, in the afternoon that he took the plea. So he had no idea that people were saying, hey, look, we want to know the inside story. We want to, there, there's, there has to be more. I don't know if he did it. I don't know what happened there. I am raising the questions and the reason why is because he was, I don't want to say imbibing, um, but substances were being implanted on him. This, okay, that sounds terrible. The MLM that she was pretending to earn the money from, and she being the wife, had stickers and those stickers were putting a substance or a combination of substances in his body. She was doubling up like he was malfunctioning. So she put a couple extra stickers on him. And yes, some say that those were part of the duo burn. So you're supposed to have a sticker on each side. It looks to me like they were doubled. He spoke of not sleeping more than two hours for several months at a time. She stated, Nicole Kessinger stated in one of your interviews that you did that he had just lost 13 pounds and she was doing his macros and all of this stuff. Then there was no reason for him to have lost that. And when the detective said, well, was he, was he taking any substances or anything, or, you know, or alcohol, whatever? She's like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, yes, he was. And she should know that because those stickers were on. Those stickers are part of an MLM. To date, there is nothing that shows the chemical makeup of the chem of the stickers that he had on him at that time. There was one of the detectives who got some of the MLM product that was developed afterwards, but we don't know what was going into him. He stated that there were demons in the room with him when he says he did what he did. So my thing is, is that he gave at least three different explanations or quasi confessions. It is not acceptable then to take one part of what he said and sentence him to life without the possibility of parole without looking at the whole picture and saying, who, what are demons? Who are demons? What does a demon mean to you? It is not acceptable for detectives or interviewers to come even two hour, two years later and say, and accept that as an explanation and not go further into looking at, was he hallucinating? Is he sim, is he being symbolic? He speaks in biblical code. And I was able to take some of what he said and translate it out from his Sherilyn Cadle interviews when he referred to his wife as Gomer, which would make him Homer. Gomer was a wife who had children from other men and had affairs. And Homer and Gomer were in a situation in a, in a marriage by God. 
So I believe that there are many missed opportunities to go into what he is saying and to psychoanalyze it and understand that if he went for long periods of sleep deprivation, that that in itself can cause psychosis. So was he, was he psychotic when he did that? Does that excuse what he did? No. But does that give him the right to claim an affirmative defense? Yes. And that's the thing. I'm also very interested in the study of false confession. I see him as a person who may or may not be on the autism spectrum. There is an older um, term and it's called um, Asperger's syndrome and some people still like to be referred to that. They've not put in a newer term. It um, is the form of autism where you can be highly functioning. We, we all can think of that person um, that fits that, but now because of the political correctness of what that name represents it is not an okay term to use so i apologize for doing so but i i want to be able to put that um in people's minds to think about the interview that chris watts did on the porch where he was rocking back and forth he was self-soothing when he's in the interviews he is looking down he is almost trying to be a turtle going back in his shell he is extremely extremely non-confrontational. He is the opposite of what we typically see when we are talking about somebody who is a classic family annihilator. He has no history of any type of aggression during puberty or any of any of the psychopathic behaviors that we see around that time or ever. He had one good friend through high school. He kept to himself. He was a good student. He had a girlfriend, long-term girlfriend before. He His parents put him through NASCAR school. He loved being a mechanic. He was stable, had no confrontations from anybody. We take what we know of her, and she had a longer history in that she started doing MLMs with her father when she was 15 years old. She started doing Amway. And her and her father took their show to the road and they started uh, working at a place called the Dirty South. And it was kind of that fast lifestyle where you got this flashy car, flashy lifestyle. The commercials for the Dirty South promote that, that it's the Dirty South lifestyle. And she liked the Dirty South lifestyle. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't have kids. Now, what had happened in there allegedly, is that at some point she was accused of embezzlement. There are a lot of moving parts there where she was allegedly having an affair with the owner, embezzlement, etc., etc. Nonetheless, her first husband brought her into marital counseling and her response was to not come home at night. She did have a suitcase of $50,000 in cash and did build herself a home. The embezzlement charges were getting thicker as the stress of that went on. So did her somatic symptoms in that she felt very sick and was going to a lot of doctors to rule out certain things. It was supposed to be ruled out that she had lupus. But then one day she said that she had it. There's no corroborating evidence. And then she started saying that these MLL MLM products cured her lupus, which is against the Federal Trade Commission to say, but she still said that and said that she got to stop taking over 20 medications because of the MLM products that she sold. She sold every single product for MLMs, and this last one that is people say that she's a victim of, that that took advantage of her life, not, not at all. In fact, she cheated the MLM in that she had her husband, Christopher Watts, going to work every day and she was taking his money that he was making every day and not letting him have any control or even understanding of what was going on with the money. She took the money and bought her rank. So she's taking what he was making, buying all of the products. So then that would qualify her for the, what she called free vacations. And then the free car 
where none of what was happening was real. So it's it's as if she she saw this flashy thing for this MLM living this vacation lifestyle and she took that to the extreme. When she was accused of the embezzlement is when she met Watts. She went with Watts, got married, remarried, and lived under the radar for two years. She changed her name from Sh Sh Shannon to Shanann because she thought that with a new last name, it would be harder than for people to find her if they were coming after her for those embezzlement charges. These are all rooted in, in um, provable documents. I would not say so if it was not. So... Um, does that mean that she deserved anything? Oh, no, not at all. It's just that there's this bigger backstory in the characteristics and behavior of both, where one has that fast and ready lifestyle and wants the flashy stuff and the other doesn't. But the other one is accused of doing which would fit more in the behavior pattern than the other because we show that when Shannon, Shannon um, hit puberty, there was great strife in her adolescence. Her mother re reportedly slapped her. There's no proof of her graduating high school in there. There are other rumors surrounding her and a, a teacher that I won't get into right now. Nonetheless, Chris's passion was to be a mechanic. He loved it. She didn't feel that that fit into that lifestyle she was going to create for the new image of the new man in the new Colorado. So she had him claim that he couldn't be a mechanic anymore for Carpal Tunnel and had him get a different job. These are all things that I've proven over the hundreds of hours of research and her own videos. I am now doing a series to further describe the control that Shanann had over Chris and the girls. In the last several videos that I've done, I am referring to a book called Controlling People by Patricia Evans, which explains that psychological abuse because it is my belief that Chris was under extreme psychological abuse, verbal abuse, financial abuse, etc. And much like uh, when an earthquake happens and you see all of the damage of an earthquake, it didn't just happen. The, the earth just didn't decide to just have an earthquake. There was the tectonic plates going on underneath until something gave. And that is what I believe was going on in the Watts, that there was all of these really stressful dynamics going on in the home. And something happened that night that we can't explain. And until and if we can ever explain what happened that night, it's not fair to the victims. Patricia Evans, one of her best quotes is that we may not know that it's there until we see its impact. And I don't believe that there is a true crime case out there in which that does not speak volumes as it does the Watts. Whereas the Watts is purported to be this perfect couple by all of the headlines, this perfect couple. And then the mom goes to visit the grand the grandparents out of town. And what do you know, that dirty dog man goes and has an affair and then comes and unalives his wife and the kids and her being pregnant and everything just because he found somebody that he wants to play house with more. And as I have researched and found so much, there is nothing in those headlines that is true. And um, you say something that I say often and where I say that between the headlines that are black and white, there's gray. And the gray is where the truth resides. And I say that the, because the gray is where our gray matter is. And that's where the thinking becomes. Now, in my speaking, I am a little bit more passionate. And that is because I receive a huge amount of hate, threats, um, you name it, because I do not follow the rhetoric where just saying that Chris is a monster, blah, 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 blah. Because I I was not there, I believe there's a bigger picture here. And it's not to say that she did this. It's not to say that, that NK did anything. It's to say we don't know. That it is my belief that the detectives did not do their work in this case. And 
that has led people to believe that this is a psyop. That has led people to believe that this is conspiracy. And where I have looked at this and, and narrated every article of the discovery and everything else, I do not believe that it's conspiracy. I believe it's incompetency. And with that being said, I'd like to go through the videos a little bit and not not take... <sighs> not take you down too many rabbit holes, but just there's some things that might bring a little bit more insight as to what is is going on in some of NK's statements. I have stayed largely away from NK because at the end of the day, I don't believe that she had anything to do with the unthinkable. But I do not think that it is appropriate that she was not further investigated, nor were the apps that you suggest um, being there not investigated. It is not enough for when a crime of this magnitude happens to have somebody who is a, a large player in it not be investigated and not have her friends investigated because she says so and because she has got her bulldog daddy with her. That's not enough. You don't just stop investigating because someone told you not to. That's not doing your job. That is being manipulated. Now, if we look, and I want to say before I go further that I'm using your video, even though you said it's okay for people to do so because then, you know, it gives you some more insight. I'd like to use your video under the Fair Use Act and Disclaimer in Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, where allowance is made in the four-factor balancing balancing act test, where a small portion of the original material is used, and that new work is critique, satire, or education, and that the commercial value of the original is not diminished and that new work is predominantly original product of a user. And I sourced that out of Emerging Ed Tech and Termly. So um, again, I'd like to use this as, as you've invited. Um, but I largely do not go to other creators' channels because I like my ideas to be original. As I said, I believe that there is a place for all of us to put forth the information. Now, when we go here and we go to... 06. Let me see if I can get in here. But you and I, we can read between the lines. We can recognize. I was like real fast. And I'm like, you need to start looking for a new place to live. And I'm like, where do you want to live? And so notice how she constantly phrases these things as if she's like she's Chris's big sister. Almost like she's a marriage counselor to Chris and his wife. Well, what are you going to do with your house? The market is fire right now. It's a perfect time to sell. How about you and your wife sell your house? You should also find a place to live. I'm just here to help you. I'm like Chris's fairy godmother. I'm just here to help. I don't care about my own self-interest. I just want to help Chris. That's the impression she is giving off. I think the CBI is buying it. But you and I, we can read between the lines. We can recognize the words, multiple words of minimization, of manipulation, right? Tons of cards from the deception deck in this. I love your um, way in which you have the the deception deck. I'm going to um, buy those. I, I'm very interested in what you did. And I think that you would have, I think that you would be called as an expert witness in this case, if it were to ever go to trial, I think that you are so valuable and I'm so glad that you are speaking in it. Now, what I'm going to say here is that now it, that I've given you a nutshell of the way that Shanann's personality was to Chris, she was very, very controlling. Chris had no idea even how much money he had because she was, in fact, using his money for the other purpose. She came into the relationship with him bankrupt. They had then had a subsequent bankruptcy and they were headed towards a third bankruptcy. She was saying that that was because of the girl's medical bills. Nothing could be further from the truth. The, um, the credit cards and whatnot were for living outside of their means. 
So if we go back to the body cam on the first day and the officer says, you know, has she used the bank account? You know, is she, because basically, as you would know, when somebody goes missing, the spouse and whatnot, they say, where was the last time they used a credit card? So you can see if they just filled up for gas two hours away and they're on their way, you know, out west or whatever. As we saw, Chris had no idea how to look at his own bank account. That is because she had everything controlled and hidden because she was, in fact, if you look at the videos, it's obvious, but I will say allegedly here, she was having affairs of her own. When she was going on those free vacations, she was going with another man also named Chris. Allegedly. I have shown videos to this effect. Other people have. It was not a secret to Chris or Shanann that they were each having affairs. They were separating. This was not part of what made good headlines. So that is where that got lost in translation. But they were very disconnected, living two very separate lives in the end. That is provable by the process of deduction. Now, the North Carolina visit has a lot of moving parts to it as well. So if we look at NK and the way that she's talking about how she talks to Chris, like you cite that she's a big sister, a fairy godmother, even a marriage counselor. Chris likes that kind of gal. He likes a woman who tells him exactly well, like NK did, tells him what to eat. Shanann did the same thing. Shanann had these little lists that he had to do and complete each day. No wonder he couldn't sleep. So if we stay in here, she's telling him what to do. You're seeing that same control. Now, he cannot answer her in a two-way conversation because how is Chris supposed to say to the new woman, um... I don't know how much money I have because I'm not allowed to look at my own bank account and I am probably bankrupt. And what Chris Watts did not know was that that Colorado house was in fact heading for foreclosure. The HOA was not being paid. Shanann lied and said that if she was sending the HOA payment to a, uh, the wrong address in which there would be those monies there in the account, that the HOA was in fact going to take them to court the week after the unthinkable happened. That was where there was, Shanann's mother cited that there was a ongoing family matter that they were going to court for. That is where people said that, oh, family matter, family court, that must mean there's CPS involvement. I did not get that out of that as I looked at the address and it was an HOA company taking them and it was in the courthouse where all hearings are. It was their, I don't know if it's a superior courthouse, whatever you call it there. So it is, I do not believe in the CP. There's a lot of people out there who say that there were CPS things that Shanann could not be around her kids, etc. etc. I could not prove that based in reasoning or any type of truth. So I do not go there where, well, other people do. What I can say is that Shanann did not even allow Christopher Watts to see his own mail. That, in fact, well, she was gone for that six weeks period, week period, and every other time that she was gone on her vacations with the other man, she had her friends or her own mother getting the mail. So Christopher Watts could not even see the mail. This was done in an effort, I believe, so that he did not know that the home was going into foreclosure. He did not have a home to sell. NK does not know that. And Chris probably n suspects that there's not a lot of equity. He probably suspected that there were more credit cards. So if they sold the house, it would go to credit cards. But well, NK is saying this stuff, Christopher cannot emote the truth that his wife doesn't let him see anything because how can he put those into words when he is not even strong enough to speak up to his wife that they are separating and say, hey, look, 
I want to see how much money I have because he can't say that to her. So this is where I think that you are very right in how some of these conversations are going and that they are one sided. And so she is saying, Chris, what the what are you doing? Why are you dragging your feet? Come on, let's go. And he's like, oh, yeah, uh, maybe maybe next uh, uh, month. Yeah, maybe next month because he can't say to her. He doesn't have any money. That's why he was using those gift cards or whatever that he had earned for work to pay for when they were going. And that's where that one charge that he did use the credit card was the kiss of death because then Shanann was able to say, this amount is not how much you would have spent for yourself. And so there is that. Um, it. I did a video where... My question is, on the body cam, the day before the unthinkable, when Christopher Watts was home and the girls were going to a birthday party that Shanann had still controlled, that she would, the kids couldn't even have cake at the birthday party, etc., etc., Christopher Watts was going through a pile of mail. It is my suspicion that that Saturday before the Sunday she returned, was the first time that he had possibly seen the mail. And he kept the mail out in the car because he was going to confront her about what he found. So on the body cam where you see him ruffling through the mail, I believe that that is a huge contributor to what may have happened. It may have been the big fight, the big earthquake to the the tectonic plates that were going, all of the stress going under where he saw something in that mail that said basically the home was going into foreclosure and none of the money that he thought that he was making each day to go and provide or start a life of his own was there. So where he did possibly have hopes and plans to go somewhere with NK were then not there. Could that speak to him going from hopeful to hopeless? Possibly. Because as you and I know, you never mess with somebody who's hopeless, who has nothing to lose. Because a person who has nothing to lose loses nothing if they do the unthinkable. This is why I believe there needs to be a trial. In reality, I think she's telling 100% truth, but she's leaving out the context that this conversation went more like this. When are you going to sell your damn house? The market's fire right now. You have no excuse. Sell it and also find somewhere to live. If you're actually serious about being with me, why haven't you found another place to live? Are you stringing me along? That's probably how this conversation went. And she's basically telling this that in her own words, which is fascinating, and which is how 99% of manipulators and liars do it. What did Nicole Kessinger actually say to Chris Watts? I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis. And this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. In today's video, we'll analyze a segment of Nicole's interview with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and will read between the lines to get to the truth of her involvement or lack of involvement in the Chris Watts tragedy. tragedy. This is my second video in this series. Without further ado, let's continue listening. Yeah, I flew out there and I thought I had like convinced him to like try to make peace with her and I was like if you guys work on this like I'm out because what's the point like I'm not trying to be with somebody that's in another relationship which I know that sounds silly given the whole relationship that we had in the first place but I really was under the impression that they were separated I mean all right one thing that Nicole does a lot and you'll notice people do this in everyday life is they tell you the truth so they say things that are 99% true, but the deception is in the way they spin their words in the information treatment. For example, here, it sounds like Nicole is saying that she was trying to convince Chris to get back with his wife because she didn't want to be a mistress or a third wheel. But that's not exactly what she said. I think she and Chris argued a lot about his re relationship with his wife, and I think she encouraged him to break up with his wife. And she just told us that. 
So listen to her exact words again. And notice how what she's saying might sound like she's she's the good guy in the story, when in reality, it sounds like she was giving Chris an ultimatum, if we listen to what she actually... I completely agree. And with her body language, when she took that pause, she looked down and back up, almost like it is my, it is my opinion that when she did that, she would she would look up and be like, you know, did I did I convince you? Did did what I just say make it sound like I'm the good guy here? Now, the six weeks in Col- in North Carolina are a huge other piece of this. As Shanann was openly speaking, she spoke in a like a Benny Hanna situation where there was a, a table in people, a stranger sitting around, and she spoke openly about the divorce because she found out that another person at that Benny Hanna style table was in fact an attorney that did um, family law, and so she was talking about what are her chances of getting custody. Um, in a divorce in Colorado. She was not secretive. When she went out to North Carolina for that final six weeks, she talked about getting divorced. On one of the interviews that they had in North Carolina, showing the North Carolina connection to the Colorado Watts on a living, one of the salon owners was talking about, oh, Chris is such a creep. And she was talking about how Shanann was talking about divorcing him. It is my contention after looking at everything that Shanann took those girls to North Carolina with no intention of ever coming back to Colorado. She left that the way that she went to Colorado when she had done a big old dumpster fire in North Carolina and went the way of Colorado the last time for the embezzling and whatnot. She did the same thing did a dump, big old dumpster fire in Colorado and then went back and went back under the safety and protection of her parents. There is fights that were staged with Chris's parents. I have done um, recent and longer videos about them in the Nutgate and the Napgate series in that very early in the vacation, she staged this huge fight and accused Chris's parents of trying to unalive Cece by giving her nuts, which was not true, and I won't go into it, but it is my opinion that she staged that fight to get the watts off of her, well, proverbial ass, so that she could be there doing what she wanted to do. The man who is allegedly involved with her, the one that she was traveling with, sitting with, partying with, pictured with, joked around about being the father of her youngest child, is possibly implied of being the father of the child that she had in utero, and why she was lying about her due date and why she had not yet been to a doctor to that point in her pregnancy of where she was saying that she was 15 weeks and she was not. He's out there in North Carolina. So once she got the watts off of her trial, she could leave the girls and then she went on several little mini vacations with the other man. It is rumored that she went with the other man looking for places to stay. Now, if indeed she did give the ultimatum to the other man who is was married and who had two children of his own, and she said, I left Chris, I'm out here now, and he said, <laughs> you might be fun for these vacations, honey, but I'm not leaving my wife. Whatever it is, something happened there where then she went back to the person that she was when Chris first met her, very, very sick, um, not eating, having all of the somatic symptoms of stress coming throughout the body. And that is where and when the pressure of her telling Chris they had to get back together came in. Because in the beginning of it, and Chris went out there and she was on her, you got to forgive me, Chris, campaign, because it adds up to the other Chris saying, uh, I'm not doing this. These things were all moving parts. So is it true that Chris in his mind was living a separate life and he didn't think he was doing anything wrong by moving forward because he knew that baby in her stomach was not his. That's why she filmed the oops, we did it again video 
because she filmed telling him that she was pregnant so that his reaction would not be how as it was where you see him fumbling around the words and he's like huh uh because when he tells later in conversations of when he last had relations that adds up to where she was saying she was pregnant but the the actual crown to rump measurement of baby Nico in utero does not add up to the dates. The dates that add up are when she was back on a vacation with the other man. So there's all of these things. So when she talks about her being out of town, she was out of town basically advertising in all of these videos showing off the other man. There's a part of Chris that probably went along with it for a while and believed that what she was showing everybody wasn't true because she said it wasn't true. There was a lot of gaslighting in it. And I I differ. I don't believe that Chris is a psychopath. I don't believe um, a lot of things in there. A, a lot of opportunities are missed and maybe they will come through because when the the when they analyzed Chris to see what kind of a prisoner he would be for placement, they saw that his IQ is 140. From that point, I don't see where they psychoanalyzed him or <laughs> or saw anything further. I saw, I think that they saw that, okay, he's got an IQ of 140. He's not going to be problematic. He has no history of um, violence anywhere else and they'll place him here. I don't see where they went further and analyzed to see if he is indeed a psychopath, sociopath. I don't believe that he's the narcissist. I believe that his wife was the narcissist. And I believe that he mirrored traits of her narcissism in all of the complex financial, verbal, mental abuse that was going on and physical abuse. She bragged about beating him up. She bragged about beating him up all the way across the house and throwing him out on the porch. There are videos that show her openly humiliating him. So when he gets involved with NK, who is then interested in him, but also controlling, we have a new dynamic. And I think it's interesting because we're going to get to the separate rooms. And let me see. I have that in here as 319. So I need to find out. Let's see if I can find that. What he said. Um, yeah, I flew out there and I thought I had like convinced him to like try to make peace with her. And I was like, right. I thought I had convinced him to try to make peace with her. What does making peace mean? Well, making peace can be I tried to convince him to have an amicable, amicable breakup from his wife, right? To get divorced, settle issues with the kids so he can come live with me. But making peace can also be interpreted as I tried to convince him to get back to his back with his wife and make everything peaceful with her. And from part one in this series, where we looked at the first portion of this interview that she had with the CBI, it seems like these detectives are interpreting her words the way she wants them to. And in that section, we looked at her discussing access to her phone and the messages that she and Chris sent. Here, it looks like we're getting into the relationship between Nicole and Chris and Shanann. So these de the detective might be interpreting this as, hey, Nicole was, you know, adamant that he either get back with his wife or break up. And she was trying to get him to make peace with his wife and get back with her um, or not. I think that the ultimatum situation is there. And I think that that increased his stress because knowing more of the backstory that I'm kind of showing Chris is being used like a yo-yo by his wife that he believes that he has first loyalty to as he it has been under her control for so long. He's trying to break out of that control. And when his 
separated wife is with the other man and letting Chris live that separate life. Chris is this person to NK. But then when Shanann comes back and says, no, Chris, we're getting back together. I'm coming back. You have to forgive me. Then he doesn't know what to say to her. Chris cannot emote the massive amount of control that he's under. And that is where I believe he just got avoidant. Went like a literal turtle and went inside himself and said whatever he had to say to make everybody go away and leave him alone and not ask him any questions for the rest of his life. Just to let him be left alone. Rather than him take a second to try to figure out what he thinks, what he wants, what he knows, he chose to continue to avoid. This is years of control trying to break out. And I don't think he could do it. And that's where Nicole's not understanding. She's seeing him, seeing him not attached to his wife, saying these things. And that's where, indeed, I think that these ultimatums were coming out because he couldn't tell her the other half. So they'd probably start with these conversations and she'd say what she wanted to say. And then they would physically connect because we know that there was a very physical aspect to their relationship. And the physical aspect was a way where he did not have to explain what was truly going on and why he could not take the steps that he may have wanted to, to get out of the relationship. It's not as, it's not as cut and dry as it could look to her. Or to anybody. And again, it is the failure of the investigators to look past and understand what was going on here. I believe that once he gave the quasi-confession, they stopped the clock and they did not examine anything. I wish there would have been a reason for them to have taken his blood, urine, or any other substance to see what was truly in those stickers. What is a substance that allows you to lose weight work harder and not sleep for more than two hours for months at a time. Hmm. Huh. Was it the sleep deprivation causing him to see demons or what was in those patches? It is rumored that that company changed the formulary of what was in those stickers at that time. I do not know if that is true. I cannot verify that. But in reality, what it sounds like, and based on her use of the word convince and make peace, is she was trying to convince him to leave his wife. And you only have to try to convince people when they're giving you resistance. So they might have argued about this a lot. And that's where I don't believe it's true resistance versus he doesn't know how. He doesn't know how to stand up to Shanann. Because she's bragged about beating him up. She's bragged about other things. And there are much darker components in here. <sighs> Shanann had extreme rituals for the girls that she was having Chris perform and was videotaping them. I am not going to say it right here, right now, but it is my opinion that... She was possibly setting him up to blackmail him. It's dark. So let's keep listening. So make peace is a vague term. Technically, she's not lying. It could be interpreted both ways. But the fact that she's saying she was trying to convince him to make peace sounds like she was trying to convince him to have an amicable breakup with his wife. Like and there with his wife there is no amicable breakup there is no way to question her 
what happened to his parents each time they tried to tell Chris that something wasn't right is reflective of that. She accused his parents of trying to unalive their own grandchildren. Shanann went right there. That as soon as some, somebody is questioning it, oh, you're trying to kill them. You're trying to do this. What happened in the last few days in North Carolina is that Chris's parents and his sister were so afraid of the way that Shanann was acting and saying that they felt that she was going to do something to Chris if he went back alone with her. They did not want him to be alone with her. They told him, do not go back to Colorado with her. Do not be alone with her. He said, he's fine. Don't worry. They said, we need some kind of proof that if something happens to you, we can tell the police that you didn't do it. So he wrote down with his parents and his sister there. He wrote down the words, if anything happens to me or my children, look at my wife. I would never do anything to hurt them. And he signed it, Christopher Watts. When the girls and Shanann were missing, Chris's dad was the first one to get out there. He brought that letter to the investigators. He said, and it's shown, he said, they they wrote this. He talked about the um the weird blanket over the girl's face, the doll's face in a video that Shanana had on her Facebook. That is what is called Napgate. There are a lot of moving theories there. I go with the facts and the discovery on that. Um, but Ronnie brought that piece of paper and showed it to the investigators as well. Ronnie at that time mumbled because Ronnie um is very very non confront non-confrontational as well and so ronnie started saying and he was mumbling and, and stuttering like he does and he's nervous and he's like well don't we need some kind of kind of like a, a lawyer person or a lawyer or something like that and the investigators ignored what he said and then went on full pressure towards chris and told him that he had failed the um lie detector test and he wanted to talk to his dad. They put on the pressure. This is where you see that interview going where that clock is ticking. And where the tan burglar in her white and black stripes is massaging Chris's shoulders in a way that if that was reversed, if a female was being massaged in that way, if a female being accused of or thought of doing the unthinkable and a male investigator from the CBI was massaging a woman in that way, that would be seen as coercion. For her to be massaging Chris physically, let out that quasi-confession as Chris is a people pleaser. He's easy to manipulate. He's easy to control. This is the problem that I have, and I believe that a good attorney could have gotten at least part of, if not all of that confession thrown out. Do you agree, Deception Detective, or do you feel that that confession was done under Miranda? Do you believe that it's done, that it would have stayed in the consideration if there was a trial or would a judge have had that part removed for its if that part of the investigation was taken out could Chris still be convicted of what he took a plea of I am not saying that he needs to be free I am saying that he needs to be understood. And if anybody else was involved, all of this has to be analyzed. I have a problem with the timeline. I don't believe that what he is accused of could have happened in that short amount of time. I don't think this adds up. Now, in the comments, 
you will get people saying all kinds of different things about what I am saying because there are people who have made content on this case on things that are not based in truth. In fact, the letter that I just referred to is now what somebody has as content saying that Chris's dad took it to a lawyer and a lawyer said, get rid of that. That's premeditation. That's Chris's pre... And that's that's not that. Everything I say has its basis and its root in documents that I can prove. So as you are probably seeing, you're going to get a lot of people saying a lot of things and a lot of things don't make sense. But I have no reason to lie financially or otherwise. I truly believe that the truth needs to come out and the truth is nowhere near the surface in this case. You guys work on this like I'm out because what's the point? Like I'm not. See, so if you work on it, I'm out. If you stay with her and resolve your relationship, I'm out of here. Once again, she's could sound like she's the good guy, right? If you guys resolve your marriage, hey, I'm out of here. I, I won't be a nuisance. But this could also be an ultimatum. Look, you either break up with her and stay with me or make peace with her, get together. I'm out. Pick. Pick one. I'm not trying to be with somebody that's in. And that is a huge thing because the way that it's going is that when Shanann goes out of town, she's with another man. Chris is left behind. Now, when Shanann leaves Chris behind, he has a huge list of things that he has to do and a whole routine that he has to continue to inflict upon the girls because she had bizarre rituals with the girls so that when she was gone, nothing would be out of order. So Chris might have been like, Okay, well, when she's gone, I can be with you because she's with somebody else. But then when she's back in town, I can't be with you. And he doesn't see the problem because she's been doing this for years, allegedly. And so he, this is an ultimatum that nobody in the room is understanding because all of these level layers of the onion have not been peeled in another relationship which i know that sounds silly given the whole relationship that we had in the first place but i really was under the impression that they were separating i mean it was like reiterated to me so many times that that's what i thought it was and it made sense to me too because like he could pretty much call me whenever he wanted like i was the one that would tell him like hey when your kids are awake you need to spend time with your kids like so notice how she's explaining herself now one thing that liars typically do is they over explain themselves. They feel the need to explain their situation in order to persuade. Why is that? Because they know they're lying. So in the back of their mind, they're thinking, hey, I know I'm lying. Maybe they do too. So I should really persuade them here. This is significant because in Shanann's rituals, what she referred to, she had her children sleep trained, food trained, etc etc from birth with Cece and when from when Bella was uh, very young she had a ritual in which the girls were behind closed doors not allowed toilet privileges not allowed any food or drink they were locked in their rooms from the outside Chris went around with like, like a janitor key of rings around his he had a key ring now when Shanann was fully asleep, Chris would sneak into the girls' room and bring them snacks. That speaks to somebody with empathy. That is why I do not see him as a sociopath, psychopath, or one that could have done what he is accused of doing in that he felt their needs. With that being said, the girls were locked up for 15 hours out of a 24-hour day. 6.30 to 6, 6.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. That could be a 7 o'clock, could be a 7 o'clock pushed in there. The 6.30 was generally when the medications that she had them be given, which were not prescribed by any doctor, were not against the guidelines of the FDA or anything else. She was giving them lots of Benadryl, lots of Tylenol, and rectal thermometer with lots of lube, but 
right at that 6.30 time. And from there, it was a 12-hour mark. They were not allowed to have any toys or anything in their rooms. They were subjected to these loud noise machines turned up because she didn't want them to hear her or Chris on the outside. The nap ritual was from 12 to 3 every day without exception. Yes, even when they were in the overpriced daycare and she made the girls be taken away and separated and pictures of the girls in isolation taking those naps were sent to her as proof. So we have this 15 hour out of a 24 hour day where children in her mind were trained. She would brag about this saying that she has her girls trained so that her time comes in in the evening for her and Chris to watch TV for them to have their adult time. That's how it began in the beginning. As they went and started to live their separate lives, they had separate lives from that time on. So you can see that and Kay has no idea that there is this backstory of that routine. But when she's saying things like, well, yeah, when the girls are asleep, you call me. Yeah, because he was allowed to do so. Whether or not Shanann was out of town or even in town, he was allowed to go downstairs, do his things, be on the phone to his lover, as she may have been on her lover. But this is consistent to what he has time for and she doesn't understand the significance of it and that's one reason that over persuasiveness is a sign of deception when people start explaining themselves you know because or so or therefore it's a good sign that they might be lying to you and that is of course in my deception deck my 52 favorite rules for spotting deception and manipulation which you can order at deceptiondeck.com so we can see here that she's explaining why he thought they were on the outs. When in reality, if she actually believed that, she could just say, he fooled me. I didn't, I didn't need any reason to believe it. He told me it. I believed him. Done. Instead of gathering all this evidence and presenting it as to why she thought they were split up. If she actually thought they were split up, why would she feel the need to convince him to either repair his relationship with his wife or break up with her so she's not a third wheel? There's lots of inconsistencies in Nicole's story. Like, do that. And then after they go to bed, like, if you want to talk to me, you can talk to me. But it was never, like, this super, super restricted thing. Like, sometimes, like, right after work, if I was, like, still talking to him, I'd get kind of bummed out. And I, you know, I tell him, I'm just like, oh, it's frustrating sometimes, like, having to, like, wait. But at the same time, I was never like, this is horrible or... So notice how she minimizes. You know, I told him sometimes it was frustrating that I have to wait. Also, the fact that she knows she's waiting because he's with his wife means she knows they're not split up. Well, it wasn't so much with the wife. It was with the girls that in that time period from when Chris got home, Chris had to feed the girls, bathe the girls, do the ritual with the anal thermometer and the... Um, he also had to wash their clothes and hang them each up to dry, air dry. Do not put the girls' clothes in um, the dryer. And he had to um, pack their backpacks and their lunches for the next day. So he had a very rigid schedule that he needed to get done with the girls, for the girls, in that time frame. And then he was allowed to do with what he wants. So again, there there is that time. It it is, it is what she sees as him having the time. It all adds up. She just doesn't know why it's that way. Even the fact that she said it was never super restrictive means that it was to a degree restrictive. She was aware that to a certain point, his wife was restricting his ability to call her. So we've caught her in a lie, minimization, and exaggeration. So she minimizes her role. Right? I told him once in a while, I was kind of frustrated. I told him either make peace or, hey, I'm out of here. I, I, I don't want to be a nuisance to your happy marriage. She minimized. But there's more to it in that he has rigid expectations with the lists and what he is, what he has to do. So it makes sense if you know the whole story.
recognizes the role the wife played. It, it was, it wasn't super restrictive. It was a little bit restrictive that he had to tiptoe around his wife. The point is that Nicole doesn't necessarily give outright lies. She deceives through the use of exaggeration and minimization, right? And minimizing. And that is what 99% of people do. 99% of people will not fabricate a bold face lie. Instead, the most common way to lie is they will just omit something. So they'll tell you a story, but they'll leave out the context that makes them look bad so that you're left with an incorrect perception of what happened. And then really sophisticated liars like politicians um, or lawyers like Alan Dershowitz, who I've analyzed on the channel, what they do is they do something called information treatment, where they tell you the whole truth. Everything they say is true. But they also add extra words on top of it and extra grammatical uh, techniques to actually distort your view of the truth. So that if you ever do call them out online, they can say, well, technically I didn't lie. I told you the truth. It's not my fault that you interpreted it that way. And if you want to see some examples of that, you can watch my video, um, How to Spot a Sophisticated Manipulator. You know, it was always like, I just said, why? But then once his kids were asleep, he never, like, had any... It was like he could do what he wanted. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. he was in his basement, and she's upstairs, and they're not speaking. And that is 1,000% the truth. And these are all provable. And Shanann was ahead of her time in that she was the original social media mom, the social media influencer. She had um, the camera there going, um, always trying to make these commercials to kind of cover for the fact that she wasn't actually selling. She was buying the product to buy the rank and not earning in the same way. But in everybody's mind, oh, she's always talking about this. She's she's drinking this product, you know. Oh, it made her able to do this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what NK is saying lines up to what we know in Shanann's rigid, rigid control. Now, there, everything I'm saying is rooted in Shanann's own words. There's an excellent creator called Neeks Peaks. And Neeks Peaks, N-E-E-K-S, P-E-E-K-S, um, is extremely talented and has taken all of the videos from Shanann's own Facebook and shown them and shown them an order of and how we can see that everything is there for her own way. Because why would anybody believe what I'm saying? It sounds crazy. She blamed these rituals on the book baby wise i'm a mom of six um i had never heard of these bizarre things i had never heard of baby wise i went and i got the copies of the book that shanann was referring to at the time period in which the editions were out that she would have read because there are several books there is nothing in the baby wise books that is even close to what she was doing and nobody would ever say that to lock up children from the outside and have noise machines for 15 hours out of a 24-hour day is acceptable in any way, shape, or form. The kind of parenting she was doing is much more similar to Flowers in the Attic. And if you look at the Flowers in the Attic, you've got that mom that wanted to have this other lifestyle that the children didn't really fit into. And, and it goes to this. And again, does that mean that, oh, she deserved this? No. But does that mean that this puts a bigger explanation into what was going on and why and whatever happened culminated because of the massive amount of stress going on. Yes. Neeks does not um, get into the politics, the drama or anything like that. But I would suggest that if people want to know more of what I'm talking about, to look at Neeks Peaks videos. Amazing work. Amazing work. Um, many of the things that I'm referring to are taken on other channels and they are voiced over to continue the headlines and the rhetoric of the people who <sighs> cause so much, so much drama, chaos, and nonsense with this case. The, the, 
uh, the way that people will not understand that there is more to this case and that it is not black and white, yes or no, it is very problematic. You've got a huge group of people that think in only that way, that yes or no, black or white, there's gray here. Use your gray matter. And people who don't have gray matter and have very smooth brains don't understand the complexity of this case. And the complexity of this case wasn't for these initial detectives to know. That's where the trial lawyers would have found this out. That's where Chris would have had a psychologist working with him. That's where good investigators would have went into the communication that was more than just the voicemails, the, what was in text. They would have found the apps that you did, the deception detective, are saying are there. And we would have looked more into what kind of pressure NK was putting on. Because if, if he has the pressure coming from both sides, did he snap? Or did Jim have something to do with it? I mean, you just, all of these things needed to be explored. It's unfortunate that so much attention was given to the people who tried to insert themselves, such as the Trent Bolt and all of that. They got all of these interviews, which just muddied the waters so much. Now, what... I want to find is where they're talking about the bedrooms. Let me see if I can find that. So it kind of made sense. It wasn't like... And you guys are just texting. So that's how she says it kind of made sense. She uses lots of deceptive words. In fact, if I were to count all the cards in the deception deck right now, right, that Nicole uses, we would have a royal flush. Right. She uses minimizing words. She uses uh, exaggerating words. So here she says it was kind of. So let's play that again. And this is something, right? I know lots of the videos I do are true crime videos. And that's because that's the videos that my audience watches. Because the stakes are high. True crime names are well known around the world. Everyone knows Chris Watts. Everyone knows Nicole Kessinger. Everyone knows Madeline McCann, John Benet Ramsey, etc. But the right, I was really trying to help him out. I don't think so. And even now, she can't help but put the patronizing and mocking tone, just a little bit of it, that she probably used when she was actually saying this to right, I was really trying to help him out. I don't think so. And even now, she can't help but put the patronizing and mocking tone just a little bit of it that she probably used when she was actually saying this to Chris. Do I think for a second that she actually cared where his children were going to sleep in a new house? Of course not. This sounds like the tactics of someone trying to manipulate him or trying to bully him into selling his house and doing what he promised he would do, which is sell his house get away from his wife and kids and go live with her in a new residence. Do, you know, like do an apartment? Like, what do you want? You know, where do you want to live? Because he's in Frederick, but that whole area over there is just like a bunch of small towns and you can kind of just pick and choose. Everything's kind of, you know, and so um, he told me why I like Brighton and I was like, okay. And then he told me, he wanted a two-bedroom apartment and he said he wanted one room for him and the other room for his two girls and I thought it was kind of cute like I remember telling him I was like yeah me and my sister had bunk beds like at my dad's house and I was like when we were little girls and we were me and my sister the same age apart is again ask yourself why were they talking about bunk beds why was she telling him about bunk beds Probably because they were both sitting down in front of a computer and she was trying to convince him to get a two-bedroom apartment rather than splurging on a three-bedroom apartment. And here is the backstory: is that Shanann, the mom, did not want Bella to get at Cece, as she said. So Cece's the younger one, Bella's the older one. In the home that they had, they had the bathroom 
between them. So they had the Jack and Jill setup where you got two bedrooms and a bathroom in between. So you would think that that bathroom would be there for the girls to use and whatnot. Well, if you think back to the detectives going through the house and what they found was that there was no water in that toilet. There was no water in the toilet between the two girls' rooms. Why would that be? Well, what we know, based on all of the videos, is that Shanann felt like Bella was a threat to Cece. She did not want Bella getting at Cece in the crib. Bella had tried to help Cece out of the crib, which is what kids do. So not only were each girl subjected to their bedroom doors being locked, the bathroom between them was locked and the water removed from the toilet. As they were not allowed to have water for that 15 amount of uh, 15 hours at a time, the girls were continually thirsty and the younger one would drink from the toilet. So that was taken out of that. Shanann would not allow the girls to be together during those 15 hours. Okay. Chris probably doesn't know how to explain this kind of bizarre control to another human being. Shanann's parents obeyed it because they knew not to question Shanann. Somehow her father knows that Shanann has freakishly strong legs, which is why he doesn't believe that Christopher could have done what he did. A lot of us who have heard Shanann talk about how she was physically able to control him don't see how what he says could have happened because most of us think she could have taken him. Plus, she had a significant blood alcohol content that is not a normal product of decomposition, especially not in a pregnant woman. So... He's probably wobbling, saying he needs three bedrooms because he knows that he can't deter from the rigid schedule and rituals that the girls are subjected to, that they're not allowed to be together. They're not allowed to have fun, laugh, eat, be married because Shanann has extreme control on the girls. So this conversation where it goes from Chris saying, oh, I need a three bedroom to a two bedroom where he wants a two bedroom probably for cost. And she's like, yeah, a two bedroom would be cool because then the girls could have bunk beds and everything. Chris is knowing that he's not going to be able to get Shanann to sign off on this. Shanann is not going to let those girls be together in a room and bunk beds. My God, what would happen? Maybe they'd laugh. Maybe they'd play. Even at the daycare, that ritual of the nap had to be proven. 12 to 3, the girls not talking to each other. She needed them to... I don't know why. I don't know why. I didn't do this to any of my kids. I don't get it. I, like most normal people, know that before the age of five, children are sponges and their mind grows faster than at any time. And that the the, the schedule is reversed. That you have the kids learning, loving, running, happy, eating, bathing, running, swimming for 15 hours of the day and sleeping for eight of it. All of these things are at play. The psychological control and manipulation that he was under is the big elephant in the room that nobody is talking about. Because Nicole is trying to say her side of the conversations that probably did come to this and frustration because Chris could not give the other side of why what she's saying didn't make sense. And again, that's why it would just go to the physical aspect of their relationship because he can't say, well, my weird ass wife wants me to do this and that. And the girls can't do that. And what? Because Nicole's on the outside. Nicole's thinking of, like she says, teaching the girls about house plants and, and, and all of this and the things that she has planned in her life. And Chris is going, in his mind, the girls aren't allowed to touch 
green things. They're not allowed to be outside and have fun and laugh. The micromanaging that Shanann had for those girls was going to be very problematic in a divorce. And I don't think that Chris understood how he was going to be able to do it all. Because, well, he would probably be having conversations with Nicole about this life and this fun that they could have with the girls. And the girls would have their own bunk beds. And he probably fantasized about what a fun life that would be for them all. But then reality would set in and he'd think about how he would answer for this and how going against Shanann would be the kiss of death. She would accuse him of trying to unalive the girls because it went that extreme. She accused his mom of trying to unalive Cece. Because when she went out to North Carolina, she gave a a list of groceries that Chris's mom had to buy to have in the house for the girls. And when she got there, the list was not followed perfectly. And another flavor of ice cream was offered to another cousin. And somehow that ice cream was created in a factory that may or may not have had nuts that CC's allergic to. Well, in reality, the Thrive products were very much created in factories that had nuts. So CC was being exposed to those every day. But because Chris's mom did not follow the grocery list exactly as it was made, just as in the day before the girls were unalived, they were taken to a birthday party by Chris. But Shanann had already worked with the parents who were having the birthday party to make sure that the girls were not given the cake that the other kids were, that they would be given something different because they couldn't. If Chris had premeditated this, why would he not have let the girls have some damn cake before the next day? If he had any inkling that he was going to do this, why wouldn't he have let them eat cake let them eat the cake if he believed and was under the control that Cece would not survive if she ate the cake why wouldn't he have taken that route so then it would have been a more innocent act these things in his behavior in the 24 hours are very relevant in my belief, that show that there was no premeditation. What NK is saying is she's trying to move forward with this man and he moves like his feet are in quicksand. Most likely because he can't explain. Because NK seems like the type who would be saying in these interviews things like, his weird ass wife won't let him do this and that. She would have told these things. So I don't even think that Chris could see them as not acceptable. Chris had not been around other children growing up. He wasn't around his sister's children. As most controllers do, she took him away from his family of origin and kept him away from others so that he did not question the reality in which he was living. So where it seems like a simple conversation of a three-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment, there are these levels that Christopher Watts is trying to sort through in his brain and doesn't understand how to have a conversation with her because she is not under the control and spell that he currently is under. I'm saying your daughters can sleep in bunk beds. You and I can take the master bedroom. When your children come visit, they can use that room. We don't need two rooms for your daughters. Yes. (laughs) Yes, he does. Or else he's going to be accused of the unthinkable. This is where there is so much more to this case. And so you've got people who are saying it's a psyop. People are saying he did it. People are saying she did it. People are saying that, oh, this was a CPS 
thing and it goes on. People are saying she has other kids from other, all of this. All of this, I'm sure you've seen in your comments, De Deception Detective. But I just wanted to add some insight in what you are seeing and show you that there are even more layers. And that is why I'm passionate about the fact that this case, out of any other, needs to go to a trial. And I believe that everybody believes to be, everybody has the right to be understood. Everybody has the right to be defended, even when it seems like what they are accused of is indefensible. I don't know if he did it or not. I don't know if NK had a role in it. I don't know if Shanann had a bigger role in it. But like I say, if people are going to take Chris's confession, you can't pick and choose words out of the confession. You have to take the whole thing in where he first said that she did it, where he says that there's demons. It needs to be further taken. And it might take a psychologist years to help get through the layers of what he has blocked, what he understands, and what is the truth. I believe that there are great opportunities that were missed in people who did talk to him at first, in that he said things that I understand as I broke them down as the Homer and Gomer situation. Um, I don't think he even understands the truth. But I think that it's important that he does so that others will understand. And in honor of Cece and Bella that were being mistreated in that home, it's important to show that abusers can be beautiful. By all accounts, Shanann was beautiful and charismatic. And in one of my little groups online about narcissists and narcissistic abuse, uh, a middle-aged man posted and he said, can narcissists be women? And I thought he was joking. And I was like, no, the DSM-4 specifically states that you have to identify as a male. Then I realized he was serious. And so I think that that represents many people don't understand that the female can be the abuser in the relationship. And if we look at how the financial abuse, the control, the verbal, the emotional, and even physical abuse were going on, and that indeed it is true that Christopher Watts was very much a victim of all of those things. How did his being a victim and being a male affect what may have happened? And how can we understand the outcome unless we understand what was going on into the buildup of this? And who can make that happen? How can that happen? It can happen by people like us continuing to speak out. And my channel is being censored. I have lost monetization due to false strikes. I have people threatening me daily, threatening to take my channel, threatening people with similar names as me, threatening me, threatening me, threatening me, because I speak out against the narrative because I think that a lot of people made a lot of money on the headlines of this case. And that's a huge tragedy. And a lot of people made a lot of money trying to make the Watts out to be something that they aren't. And that is also a tragedy. And so I thank you for doing the work that you do. And I thank you for inviting um, the possibility of more information coming in the platform that you have already set up. I think um, I will look forward to contributing more information and um, I will order those cards. I, I really appreciate your work, Deception Detective. Thank you for all that you do and thank you for letting me use this under the Fair Use Act.